I'm back. Here I am. Great. And we're. My clock is a little. It's always broke. Slow. I, I said it every week and it goes. Too bad. Does they have a battery? Yeah, we did that already. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a mechanism just like the radio. All right, let's begin. We'll pray. Father, we thank you for these moments that we have and ask that you'll make them profitable to us. We pray that you'll give us alert minds, retentive minds, and hearts that are willing to share what we know. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we want to talk for a few moments about prophecy and the interpretation of prophecy. And in some thinking some folk may think that takes more than a few moments, but it's really not that complicated. We've already covered types. Types. Uh, types are have a prophetic element, obviously. The Passover lamb uh, is a clear example of that. Uh, and uh, a type is a person uh, or an action or a thing that uh, has a, a load of, of meaning in it, and the Passover lamb is an example of that. So, But then let's look at some passages. Let's go to Joel chapter 2 for just a moment. Joel chapter 2. Here is a prophetic portion, and... Uh, the blow the trumpet, verse 2, is in other words, there's an alarm. And then that familiar prophetic phrase in verse 1, the day of the Lord. This is the wrap-up. This is when he comes. This is when he settles all accounts. And obviously, because of the sinfulness of man, it's not a very pleasant day. Verse 2, it's darkness, gloom, clouds, thick darkness, blackness, so on. Verse 3, fire devour, devours, a flame burns. And uh, four, war horses. Five, rumbling of chariots. In other words, there's trouble on the scene. And uh, verse 10, the earthquakes, the heavens tremble, sun and moon darken. End of verse 11, the day of the Lord. There's our key prophetic phrase. So what's all of this about? Why is Joel saying all of this? Verse 12, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me. In other words, the prophecy of doom on the day of the Lord is not given for the purpose of details or setting a date but to call people to repentance. Return to me, fasting, weeping, mourning. Verse 13, rend your hearts, not your garments, which was ceremonial, and so on. And then return to the Lord your God. Uh, 13, he's gracious. In other words, no matter how messed up you've been, how bad your life, God is gracious, he's merciful slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relents, who knows whether he will turn, and so on. So the purpose of prophecy is to shake people up and bring them to repentance. Let's go to Titus for a moment and look at another Another passage, chapter 2 of, uh, of Titus, verse 11. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, <coughs> training, teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, <coughs> live self-controlled and upright lives. And he ties this to the second coming. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, 
Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from lawlessness. In other words, it's an opportunity for repentance, a call to repentance. Another plain passage on this, and keep moving to Second Peter. Second Peter has to do with the last days and judgment. And you, you see how this, how this works out. Second Peter, we're in the third chapter, the last chapter of the book. Let's pick it up at verse 10. Verse 10, 2 Peter 10, 3, 10. Now, the day of the, there we are. Old Testament, New Testament, this key prophetic phrase. In other words, it's the day when God settles his accounts. It's the day of uh, judgment and so on. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, unexpected. Heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The earth and the works that are done will be exposed. So here is the whole challenge of this. Uh, the end of, of everything. Flood the first time, fire the second time around. Burned up. Now, but what's the point? What is Peter hammering on. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness, godliness, waiting for the hastening and coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire, dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, and so on. But the point is, what sort of people ought we to be? So uh, people play with prophecy. They're very interested in getting the sequence right. They're very interested in hanging dates on events. But that's not the emphasis in Scripture. The emphasis in Scripture uh, with it is always a moral emphasis. In other words, the prophecies are given and there, there are warnings of judgment and disaster and gloom and terrifying acts. Uh, therefore, repent is the point. Questions. Have we hammered on this enough? Is it clear enough? That this, uh, and always in prophecy, look for that, for that element. Uh, and uh, it... The end result is twofold. Here is everything burned up, but therefore, uh, look at uh, verse 13. There's a new heaven and a new earth. In other words, there's a bright side. If you repent, you'll be on the Lord's side and everything will turn out okay. Questions? No, no questions. <laughs> Got it. Uh, uh, now, next week is the exam. So, what's this going to be? Bring your Bible, because you can use your Bible in the exam. That's not usually true, but it is true this time around. You can use your Bible in the exam. And my suggestion is to go over the quizzes that you had go over the outline carefully. Uh, and let's just skim, skim through this. Uh, since we're studying hermeneutics, you should, it's not a word that you find, that you hear on the radio, you know, every day or read in the newspaper. Uh, it's somewhat obviously a technical term. But you need to know its origin, and you need to know its meaning. And of course, uh, hermeneutics broadly applies to the interpretation of anything. Any piece of literature, uh, a law, uh, our laws, so on, but we're studying biblical hermeneutics, in other words, how to approach and interpret the scripture. 
uh, we went over the need for this, which is obvious because how, you know, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Pentecostal, a Baptist, an Episcopalian are all reading from the same Bible. Uh, how do they end up uh, in different doctrinal positions? Uh, there has to be some explanation. Are they omitting something? Are they not paying attention to something? Uh, are they uh, questioned? How they maybe interpret it also? Well, yeah, how they, they interpret it. You, you, you just take Take a simple thing like the word baptism, uh, and uh, obviously you have different positions. So how how do you arrive at a quote accurate interpretation? Is 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 the question? And so the, the need for this subject is obvious, and especially with so many cults abroad, you know. Uh, and America has is just uh, fertile ground for for cults because we have freedom of religion and uh, a lot of gullible people and uh, sometimes it's a persuasive Bible teacher of some kind and so on who leads them off and so the need that that's worth a a, a good review and a good look. And then we're talking about a proper approach to Scripture. It's one book, it's one author, it's one purpose. And uh, we want to discover not what, you know, the crazy Bible class. So what do you think the verse means? Well, what do you think it means? Well, what do you think it means? What does it mean is the question that we have to ask and so on. And then the qualifications of an interpreter. Now, there were certain verses that you were assigned, they were underlined in the outline assigned to, to learn. So as we go through this, raise any questions you have. And so as we got to, through all of this introductory material on definitions and the need for the subject and, the, and approach and qualifications of an interpreter. We got down to the, the historical aspect of interpretation. Now in a broad sense you could talk about context and remember that context has, there's more than literary context. Uh, and the, the more you can get from the scripture uh, about who is, is writing and the more familiar you are, the better you will understand. If you get a letter from someone, if it is, or any kind of writing, We don't get prescriptions from doctors anymore. They phone or email them to the pharmacist, which is a good thing. But the day was when you walked out of the doctor's office, you had a prescription. Could you read it is the question. Well, no, because uh, it was a little bit technical and somewhat uh, uh, from someone you didn't know that well, but the pharmacist had no trouble reading it, notice. Uh, and so the better acquainted you are with uh, the author, his occupation, position, education, purpose in writing, and often he just states the purpose. And then the, the, that's the personal setting. We talked about the geographical setting. 
which is, of course, uh, radically different. The seasons of the year, the vegetation, animal life, you know, political divisions. You're in a, a, another place. And a lot has been written on this and the material available in the political setting. How in the Bible it moves from the patriarchal, it's Abraham, uh, to a theocratic under Moses set up to the kingdom under Saul, David, Solomon, and the others, and so on. Then uh, Israel, uh, Israel does not live in isolation as you read the Bible. It's in constant interaction with other countries, Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Medo-Persia, Greece, and finally in the New Testament with Rome. So all of this becomes part of the context. And then the basic religious setting is with Judaism. And you weren't raised in that faith, so the more you can pick up about it, but you have to be careful uh, where you poke your finger in. Present-day Judaism is not a clear example of what went on in Bible times. Old Testament Judaism under Moses is not the same as the Judaism in the New Testament, which was roundly condemned by Christ. They had apostatized tremendously. So when we talk about context, we're really after the whole setting, the personal, the geographical, the political, the religious setting, and uh, the works, even sometimes pagan religion, enters into it, Acts 19 in Ephesus, and uh, also uh, the Samaritans, John 4, there's some passages you, you don't know anything about Samaritans. It's very hard to uh, interpret uh, a good Samaritan, Luke 10 or John 4, the woman at the well. And then we listed specific questions to ask about the writer or the speaker. Race, religion, education, literary style, authority, position, purpose, and so on. And who is addressed or spoken to, time of writing and speaking, and so on. And then the, the tools that are available to you uh, for Bible dictionaries, and of course a, an accurate translation always helps. So the whole historical aspect of interpretation is important, the broad background. The more you can pick up, the more accurate you're going to be in interpretation. And uh, you don't uh, isolate phrases, words, sentences. Uh, you don't isolate them from their literary context, from their geographical, historical, cultural context, the whole thing. So any, any questions? Questions, because next week is the exam, and uh, you should have some familiar, familiarity with the tools that are available to you. You know, we spent some time with the concordance and the Thompson chain reference and uh, Bible dictionary and so on. How many questions? Yes. How many questions will the test be? I forget, but <laughs> there are enough to cover the subject pretty okay. well. Uh, so about 100. <laughs> No, no, not 500. I, uh, you're, you're a little, my, my, the, you know the tests I give are not essay tests. And they are not, uh, they're not subjective, they're objective. And also, 
you, you've probably been in classes, and I have, where you you were you, you were guessing where the teacher was going to zero in with the test, and he had two or three things, and uh, out of the whole semester, uh, you, you're nodding. You've been in that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's sort of a. And you ask previous students in the class, you know, now, where where does where does he come in on this thing? So you just forget the rest and concentrate on those few things. I try not to give those kind of tests, but rather ones that are comprehensive, not dealing with just some segment that we've covered, but with the whole range. Uh, wandering through all the way. Uh, on this grammatical aspect of interpretation, now you're getting down to the etymology of words. We gave some attention to that. Uh, in other words, what, what does the word mean and how do you get the meaning? Uh, is it a, a word that has not been translated, but transliterated, like deacon, uh, and uh, that you don't go to Webster for the definition of Bible words. You go to a biblical dictionary. If it's a Greek word, you can, uh, by simply knowing the Greek alphabet, which is not that complicated, and I am assuming since you, you know you got it on your phone or your laptop, it's 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 available, or, or in a dictionary, just look up alphabet, and there'll be four or five given, and <clears throat> the Greek alphabet will be among them. And if you know the alphabet, it, it, it's it's simple, you know, without being a, a, a Greek student, if you know the alphabet. You can use the Greek tools, that is, a Greek lexicon, because you, you can look up the word. You know the alphabet, and, and you know the letters. Uh, you, how do you find the Greek equivalent of an English word that's in the Bible? E Young's, not strong. It's easier to use Young's. He'll always give the Hebrew, the Greek word, the Greek letters. Ah, so you're not guessing, and then you go from that to the lexicon. It's so, you, you, you know, it's, it would appear to be complicated, but it's very simple. The, the word synagogue, for instance, is uh, not an English word. We've, we've stolen it from the Greek, and it's a compound, uh, uh, S-U-N or Y, uh, is to, uh, together, and the rest is the verb to bring to, to bring, so you bring together, it's an assembly of people, that's all. Not that complicated. And in the Old Testament, you know, uh, now you, we name our children, but the meaning of the name is no big deal with us. We just pick something that maybe after an uncle or an aunt or a grandfather or uh, somebody or sometimes children are named after their same name as their parents. Uh, and uh, thinking of one family, uh, there's the first and there's this, oh, the, the Melky family, you know, Joe Melky is Joe Melky the third. His father is Joe Melky the second and the grandfather who was recently in the hospital is Joe Melky the first. Uh, so, they're all Joe Melkies, 
but you got to get the right with it. So some people name that way. But in Bible times, they were more tuned into the meaning of the word. And you can get that from Young's, Young's Concordance. It's no, no big secret. Uh, he'll give it and give the meaning. Then uh, words that you, you don't see every day, they're not newspaper words. Nazarite, Passover, uh, the needle, uh, the door, used in special sense in John 10, I am the door. Uh, the tricky passage in John 21, do you love me? Yes, I do, but they're using different words. And you get that sorted out. Then the meaning of words in sentences. Uh, de depending on how it's used it makes a difference as to what it means. Then specifically Bible words like faith, and love, temple, Emmanuel, all of these, flesh, spirit, uh, all of these. Context often determines the meaning of a word. I, my study is in a state of chaos at the present time because it's been moved. I don't know where anything is. But uh, go to your dictionary and get the word run, R-U-N. There are a dozen or more different meanings. Uh, you have the run of a project. You have, you run, you use it as a verb. Uh, you get a run in your sock or fabric uh, and on and on it goes what you you what you run yeah you you run a lawnmower uh, and and endlessly you don't really but the sentence gives the meaning of the word and so in the Bible uh, the sentence is context, the paragraph is context, the chapter, the book, and, and so on. The whole Bible is context. The grammatical thing is very important because you're getting down to the details with this and so on. And uh, then we're on to the figurative use of words and so on and figures of speech. If that is somewhat new material for you, give that a good shot. So you're familiar with the, the figures of speech because sometimes people will throw you, you know, uh, that the Bible's a foolish book. Oh, trees are, mountains are singing in the trees are clapping their hands, you know. What's this all about? Well, uh, you ought to be prepared to handle that kind of thing. So, uh, the, and parables are common, allegories, a lot of them. There are a few fables. The metonymies are perhaps the roughest ones <clears throat> and the most, the, the most unfamiliar. So, how are we doing? You know, like I say, we're, we're going to, the exam is going to be broad in, in scope. It'll give you a shot at everything, which means you're, you're not cooked if you miss one, you know, that's not a catastrophe. If you got 10, 10 questions, you miss one or two, you're almost sunk. Uh, but if you got a lot of them, you miss one. It's not the end of the world at the moment anyway. And, and uh, so then uh, 
I appreciate uh, David Montoya taking this class in my absence and uh, any questions back over those lessons that he had when I was gone in the preceding in the preceding weeks we were on internal relations the purpose of the bible symbols visual material miraculous uh, a symbol is in action or being what a metaphor is in speech always a connection or relation we're on to typical persons institutions uh, and again these the priesthood uh, in Mar Melchizedek in particular, a type of Christ, so Hebrews, and, and so on. So, any questions over that? How are we doing? How are we doing? Wait, so Melchizedek was a type of Christ, or he was Christ? What? He's a type, correct? He was not like a, He wasn't a Christophany, he was a type. Oh, no, no, he was not a Christophany. And, and when it says without father or mother, uh, <clears throat> it means his genealogy was not known. And uh, some people these days are getting interested in their genealogy, but uh, Maybe best you'll leave it alone. You may find horse thieves and other characters back in there and, and be disappointed. You know, every, everybody's ancestors didn't come over on the Mayflower. I, the boat wasn't that big. And uh, so, uh, but in, 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 in Bible times, genealogy was very important. Now, you know, no, it's not significant. Why was it important? Well, the land stayed under your family. Okay. It, it had to do with inheritance. And the land was, 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 the land was What was your livelihood? These were an agrarian people. And, and so, if you lost the land, well, you, 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 you were destitute. You didn't have anything. And so, genealogy was important because of property rights. What else? Well, if you're a Levite. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. The tribe of Levi, uh, now you're a, a, a priest, and it, it's important there. And then the big one. Judah, Judah, and right, and Christ being a descendant, and the messianic line traceable for a thousand years from David down to, to Christ. So, my... Uh, that's something, see. So, that's no big deal with us. I, I know who my grandparents were on both sides. And that's it. That's just two generations. That's nothing. That is nothing. And uh, it's no big deal with us. And uh, in some European countries years back, when, when it had to do with royalty and so on, it was more important. But in the Bible, uh, and that's another cultural shift. It's, no, it's nothing to us. But then it, it was something and very, very important to, to follow through on. So we got it pretty well put together. Huh? Any other questions? Questions? If you find out next week, yeah. No.
But if you got a fair grasp of the material, you know, especially sections where you may have found yourself in territory that you had never thought about or hadn't thought about for some time, like figures of speech or so on, uh, give that an extra shot or two, and uh, and you'll be <coughs> you'll be pretty well set. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for the opportunity that has been ours to, during this time, study how to study your word and to come up with not just what we think it says, but what it actually does say, giving us, therefore, great confidence and assurance and authority when we speak and help and teach others. Now, help us to get all of this together and help us, we pray, to use this information as we read and study your word and then as we fulfill our commitment to share it with others. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. Looking good with their pen. That's what I told them.